All right. Um, so first of all, thank you very much to the, the faculty for this honorable invitation and especially to my friend Rami. Uh, thank you very much for having me and giving me the opportunity to talk about biological reconstruction um, following resection of malignant bone tumors. Um, so if you recall the age distribution of, uh, of bone tumors, it, uh, it becomes obvious that uh, the majority of entities occurs during the first two decades of life, uh, including uh, the most frequently seen um, primary malignant bone tumors during childhood, Ewing sarcoma and osteosarcoma. And the most frequently affected anatomical sites uh, are the, the, the distal femur, the proximal tibia, the proximal femur, as well as the proximal humerus. So these are actually the anatomical sites where we have to deal with reconstructions. So this is an osteosarcoma to the distal femur. And the current, the current uh, treatment uh, strategies include uh, the administration of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, followed by a wide resection and adjuvant chemotherapy. Especially due to the implementation of systemic therapy, chemotherapy, the survival of patients with osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma has markedly improved, being as high as 70% for both entities after five years. So we have to keep in mind that probably the majority of patients with osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma is believed to have a quite normal life expectancy. Here another uh, example, this is a 13 years old girl with a bone sarcoma to the proximal femur. From a reconstructive point of view after tumor resection, we have two options. One option, is an endoprosthetic reconstruction, and the other option is a biological reconstruction. The failure modes of uh, tumor endoprosthesis are well known and have been uh, published consistently in the recent literature. We uh, differentiate mechanical and non-mechanical failure modes, but we have to be aware that about 30% of tumor endoprosthesis fail after a median of less than two years. And this is why we have the opinion that especially in, in children and adolescents and whenever suitable and possible, we should perform biological reconstructions after tumor resection. And we have plenty options. We have autografts, we have allografts, we can use extracorporeally irradiated autografts and re-implant re these grafts, or we can use techniques like the muscular technique or bone transport techniques to name only a few. The working horse um, for reconstructions after tumor resection is uh, definitely the autograft. At the upper limb, autografts work very well, and especially vascularized grafts like vascularized fibular grafts, who provide the advantage of, um, of reconstruction of, of even the glenohumeral joint. So um, uh, we can reconstruct even the joint um, of the proximal humerus. And if the physis is preserved, the graft can keep growing, which is a, a major advantage of this, uh, of this technique, at least uh, in younger patients. An alternative option in younger patients for reconstructing the proximal humerus is the clavicular prohumeral procedure, which is basically that the clavicle is flipped down to the remaining humerus in order to reconstruct the, the defect after tumor resection. Here a couple of intraoperative photos. So the clavicle is detached from the sternum 
is then dissected all the way to the lateral end at the acromioclavicular joint, which is preserved. And then the clavicle is flipped down to the uh, remaining humerus and fixed with a plate. And uh, this is how the postoperative x-ray looks like uh, with this uh, clavicle uh, fixed to um, the remaining distal humerus. And I think even from an aesthetic point of view, it is a nice reconstruction, a nice reconstruction of the shoulder girdle. Well, autografts uh, work very well at the lower limb as well. Um, this is a, a six years old patient with a Ewing sarcoma to the proximal femur. And we've done uh, a wide resection and a reconstruction using uh, a vascularized fibular graft. And you can see it is nicely ingrown and there was even a nice hypertrophy and remodeling of the fibular graft. At the distal femur, however, and this is the site which is most frequently affected by osteosarcomas, one challenge is the mismatch uh, uh, in the diameters of the remaining diaphysis, the epiphysis, and the fibular graft itself. One um, option or a better option would actually be to divide and fold the fibular graft in order to increase the cross-sectional area of the graft. But this results in most cases in a shortening of the affected um, segment and um, even in, in um, relevant leg length discrepancies at maturity. Um, during my fellowship at the Royal Children's uh, Hospital in Melbourne, a nice technique was taught to me by Professor Leo Donnan. It is actually a staged approach um, for reconstructing the distal femur. So in a first step, the tumor is selected and immediately reconstructed using a folded vascularized femur set in a so-called A-frame uh, configuration and fixed using a solid intramedullary rod. As you can see, the femur is acutely shortened, but after cessation of chemotherapy, or once uh, a relevant leg length discrepancy is obvious, the nail, the, the solid rod is exchanged and an intramedullary lengthening nail uh, inserted and an intramedullary uh, lengthening procedure performed. The cornerstone for this technique is actually the, the folded vascularized fibula graft. The fibula is harvested through a standard lateral approach and harvested um, uh, with its pedicle. Uh, uh, a central segment of about two centimeters is then cut out opposite to the vascular bundle and the, uh, in order to give the graft, uh, uh, in order to, uh, to allow a tension-free folding of the graft and leaving the periosteal continuity intact. This is an intraoperative uh, photograph. You can see the A-frame uh, reconstruction, uh, the folded vascularized uh, graft with the intact periosteum. And um, uh, finally, uh, the graft is reanastomosed to a branch of the femoral artery and vein. We have uh, analyzed the results of the first 10 patients who were treated with this method uh, in Melbourne and we are about to, to publish the results shortly. I would like to come back to, to the case I showed initially uh, at the very beginning. This is this 13 years old girl with a bone sarcoma to the proximal femur. And in this case, the reconstruction was performed using a non-vascularized fibula graft. Here you can see the results after 11 and 25 years postoperatively. As there is an ongoing and quite controversial discussion about the use of non-vascularized fibula graft for the reconstruction of large defects, we've um, done a retrospective analysis uh, during my time in Switzerland at the University Hospital of Basel. And uh, we did a, a retrospective study on all cases who were treated uh, after tumor resection between 1976 
and 2012 with non-vascularized fibular grafts. In total, uh, 35 patients were included, nine upper extremities, uh, 26 lower extremity reconstructions. To be fair, one half of patients were, uh, had a, a malignant tumor and one half, about one half uh, benign tumors. The defect size was uh, 11 centimeters on average and the graft length uh, 16 centimeters. We were particularly interested in the consolidation and hypertrophy behavior of non-vascularized fibular grafts. Therefore, we analyzed the junctions, so the graft host junctions, in total 106 junctions. And as you can see, consolidation was observed uh, in 96% of our grafts of, of, uh, of the 106 junctions, in 94% of cases within 12 months, and uh, delayed union was seen in 2% and non-union in 4% of unions. In 85% of all uh, evaluated junctions, hypertrophy was observed and in about one half of the junctions to a significant amount of, of more than 20%. I think one of the major advantages of non-muscularized fibular graft is the remodeling capacity at the donor site. And uh, we observed a remodeling in 83% of, uh, of the 24 uh, patients who uh, were amenable for, for, um, for analysis with regards to remodeling. And uh, about one half of all cases showed complete remodeling, as you can see here on, on the left-hand side. In conclusion, and what our paper comes down to is non-vascularized fibular grafts are a good indication if the defect size is less than 12 centimeters, if the uh, defect is contained with one preserved cortex. They work very well in benign tumors and in malignant tumors if there is a good soft tissue coverage preserved and uh, no chemotherapy to be administered. Um, other grafts have been used uh, um, very, very frequently, especially in the past. And you all might know this paper published by Mencken on 945 allograft reconstructions following tumor resection. Um, one ongoing issue, however, is the relatively high complication rate, including infections, fracture, and non-union. And Rodolfo Campana from, from the Instituto Ortopedico Rizzoli in Bologna published his unique technique of a composite graft of uh, an allograft um, in combination with a vascularized a fibular graft. The same group published their long-term results a couple of years later, and they come, came to the result um, that the complication rate can be decreased using this technique as compared to sole allograft um, reconstructions um, as, as reported by Mankin. To be honest, we use um, allograft reconstructions rarely and if then only in intercalary uh, defects. We use a slightly modified Campana technique, the so-called tongue in groove technique, um, which means basically that a rim is cut into the allograft where um, the vascularized fibular graft can be fixed into. And that's uh, how the graft looks like. This is uh, the cross section through the graft. Here, um, the allograft, the rim, and the vascularized fibular graft. What we additionally do is in allograft reconstructions, we use custom-made resection guides as well as custom-made um, plates or implants in order to optimize the contact area at the allograft host junctions. We don't use um, osteoarticular allografts, by the way. So this is uh, an example of a six-year-old girl with a Ewing sarcoma to the, uh, the femoral shaft. 
Here you can see intraoperatively the custom made resection guide in place. A wide resection was done, including the biopsy tract. And a really nice feature are these uh, shaping boxes where you can shape uh, the allograft to fit perfectly the defect after tumor resection, and where you can even pre drill the locking holes for the custom made locking plate. And this is the, the final result. You see this massive uh, reconstruction with a perfectly fitting allograft uh, fibular composite and this custom made plate. And this is a very solid and robust um, reconstruction. This patient fell off a horse a couple of months um, after cessation of chemotherapy. She broke her arm, but uh, the leg was, was not harmed and intact and the, the reconstruction was was um, not fractured after this fall. So extracorporeal irradiated autografts um, work quite similar. We use this technique occasionally in patients with malignant tumors where no chemotherapy is to be administered as in this 12 years old girl with an adamantinoma to the tibial shaft. How does the technique work? Um, a wide resection is done of the tumor bearing uh, segment and all the obvious tumor is resected. So all the soft tissue is resected. Um, the medullary canal is curated on a side table. The resected segment is then uh, irradiated and a lethal dose of 50 to 60 grays applied within two, uh, within two minutes to this um, segment. And in the same session, within the same operation, the segment is replanted together with a vascularized fibular graft as shown before to fill the defect and fixed with a locking plate. We have uh, evaluated our results of eight patients who were treated uh, with this technique uh, for um, tumor resections at the tibia. We observed two delayed unions, two infections, but the functional results were pretty, uh, um, pretty good and no local recurrence was observed. So in, in summary, this is, is a well-working technique and comparable to alternative treatment options in this anatomical location. As um, already mentioned, whatever you you do whatever reconstructive technique you use, you have to in mind that the majority of cases or the majority of patients is believed to have a quite normal life expectancy. And that means that we will have to deal with long term effects of our treatment, such as leg length discrepancies and deformity. The question is, can we predict leg length discrepancies at, uh, at maturity? And does, for example, the multiplier method work in patients who have had chemotherapy? We have done an analysis of our patients and the answer is not really good. So the multiplier method doesn't work well in patients who have had chemotherapy. One reason could be um, that uh, there are a specific growth pattern in patients with osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, at least in some patients. So for example, we found in some patients that they stop growing during uh, the chemotherapy treatment. And in a catch-up phase, they have a growth spurt and come back and, uh, and grow as tall as expected. It is different in Ewing sarcoma patients though. They keep growing, or some of them uh, keep growing during uh, the chemotherapy treatment, but they fuse early and uh, become smaller than, than um, expected. However, more data uh, are needed to gain more evidence um, regarding this issue. Um, well, we think that uh, beside the, the techniques we use, we have to keep in mind uh, the long-term um, effects and impacts of, of our surgeries. 
And we have the opinion that uh, new implants such as combined bone transport, and lengthening nails, or even this bio-expandable tumor prosthesis will open new horizons in terms of both a defect reconstruction and uh, leg length equalization um, in the future. Thank you very much for your attention and greetings from Munich. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lenzi, for this very interesting talk. Thank you so much, sir. Pleasure, pleasure. Dr. Thank Rami, you are the moderator with uh, Professor Lenzi. Yes, very interesting uh, talk and uh, was really, I was really, I enjoyed the whole um, uh, talk and I really learned too many of it. Uh, now is with us is uh, Professor Gamal Hosni. Hi, Rami. Hello, how are you? <laughs> fine, and you? I'm fine. How is the weather in Munich? It's minus uh, <laughs> five degrees. <laughs> very, Hi, very cold here. <laughs> how have you been doing? <laughs> I'm glad to see you. Glad to I'm see glad you. to see you too. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. So do you have any questions regarding the presentation from Professor Lenza? Yes, sure, sure. Uh, yes, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Lenza, uh, what about the lengthening in osteosarcoma? Uh, was it easy? Was it, uh, does it take such a long time for lengthening? And when you... Uh, you decide to do lengthening immediately after, or after a couple of years, or what would you think? Um, so, in for example, in this A-frame technique, um, we start lengthening after cessation of chemotherapy. Um, the 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 femur is acutely shortened uh, during the first step during the tumor resection. Then the patients uh, get the adjuvant chemotherapy, and after chemotherapy. Uh, they get the first lengthening uh, step. What, oh. what about the bone formation, the rate of bone formation, the regenerate? Uh, it, it depends. So as in, in every lengthening procedure, some form really good bone and some don't. But we have a very, very low threshold for doing bone grafting from the alia crest. And this works very well. Thank you. It is, uh, lengthening is a very, very current and interesting topic, especially at the moment, I think, with all these new nails and bone transport nails and things. And um, we have a couple ongoing cases at the moment where we have just done a resection and uh, put a cement spacer in, as, uh, really just as a, as a spacer. And these patients are uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, and we, we're going to do a bone lengthening after the chemotherapy. And I'm, I'm really curious how, how that's going to work. We are not, it's, I think it's not the time to do lengthening during chemotherapy. I, I'm sure you are aware of this Japanese group who have published their paper on, on elicit of lengthening uh, during chemotherapy. But um, I don't know, I, I think it's... To me, it's, it's, it's too, too risky to do a lengthening during chemotherapy, but at least for this Japanese group, it, it seems to work very well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rami, you have any questions to Professor Lenz? No, I really enjoyed it uh, too much. I would just like want to ask, um, do you have any implant failure when the, when the patients start to, to weight bear because I saw you are using many biological plates. Are, do you have some broken plates or some broken um, screws? Of course, of course. Um, I mean, um, biological reconstructions, there, there is a, a, a reasonable um, a failure rate also in biological reconstructions. But the, the, to me, the difference is in an endoprost reconstruction, you have a lifelong risk for, for, uh, for complications like loosening and, and infection and things. And um, for sure, the, the complication rate in biological uh, uh, reconstruction is probably higher in the short term, but lower in the, in the long term, I guess. Oh, and, uh, can you explain to me, please, uh, how does the intramedullary lengthening 
uh, work? Do you, do you control it from outside or you have to do another operation to, to make the lengthening? There are basically uh, two uh, uh, implants available on the market. So one is, is a fit bone nail, which is uh, a motor driven um, implant. You have a, a small receiver in a subcutaneous pouch and, uh, and energy is supplied from outside with a tiny little tool. And this drives the motor um, as you like one millimeter per day or whatever. And it's, it's basically the same principle with precise nail, which is a, a magnetically driven nail. You put a magnet, uh, a magnet onto the skin and this uh, drives the magnet and, and a spindle, I, I think a spindle within, uh, within the nail and you can, can lengthen as you like one millimeter per day or whatever. And do you have any special complications regarding those nails? other than infection or failure of the lengthening, some mechanical uh, complication regarding this technology? Uh, well, I think uh, infection is not a major issue in intramedullary nailing and intramedullary lengthening. We see it very, very uh, rarely. Um, what we, uh, well, uh, uh, poor bone formation is an issue, but uh, as, a, as already mentioned, we have a relatively low threshold for doing uh, a bone grafting. Sometimes um, uh, complication as, as bolt or screw loosenings and things, but um, yeah, it works well. So there's a colleague, uh, Mr. Um, Abdallah Al Jadia. He is asking, what do you prefer? Do you prefer do lengthening or bone transport after tumor excision? I don't have, uh, I don't have too much experience with bone uh, transport yet. So I have to answer this question with lengthening. So our concept was shortening and then lengthening, but this might change in the future. It is, it is, uh, it is, um, mainly because we didn't have the proper implants for bone transport um, because I think, I, I mean, uh, external fixation is, is a wonderful tool, but it was, it's always been too risky to us during chemotherapy and in tumor patients. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Lenzi, for joining us tonight with this marvelous talk. And again, congratulations to Pyrn Munich for being the championship. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> it's thank a great you. Night. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs>